Glenn. Hey, congratulations on your docuseries, uh, Cat People. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I mean, it's e it's even bigger the fact that uh, this is going to be showcased on uh, Netflix. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, excited. Uh, we, we had a big success a few years ago with our show Dogs on Netflix. So Cat People seem like a the perfect next step, the perfect next evolution in animal-based storytelling, right? <laughs> Absolutely is. Absolutely is. So what what sparked you uh, to basically create the uh, docuseries Cat People? Well, as documentary filmmakers, we're always looking to, to find stories that take us on a journey. And we're also always inclined to find stories where we can unpack, unpack something and take a closer look. And as it pertains to the latter point, when you think about cat people, often there's a negative stereotype that's associated with cat people, the crazy cat lady, which is just silly. I mean, cat people are the same, cut from the same cloth as, as dog people. They just have strong bonds with these pets. They love them like family and like children. And maybe some of them are a bit unique or eccentric, but only to the extent that it's actually quite cool. There's some really, really interesting, cool people who are cat people. So we wanted to lean into that and unpack that. And some of these folks really do have journeys that they go on with their animals. So we were able to pair those two things to tell some really, really great stories for season one. So how did you find these uh, people to participate in your docuseries? I mean, obviously, you just didn't like jump, jump on the plane and go to CatCon or something. Right. Although, you know what? Why didn't I think of that? That probably is exactly what we should have done. It would have been so much easier. Damn it. Okay. Well, I'm going to get over that now. Take a deep breath, CatCon for season two. Um, we do have uh, casting professionals who help us find these stories. The, the challenge though, is that a lot of people or most people who are cat lovers, they all think that their cat is a movie star and deserves an episode of Cat People, right? Um, but these aren't just stories about cats that are pretty or chunky or funny in some way. They're stories about cats and cat people who do have that bond who are going on a journey. So if we look at 500 stories, we might winnow it down to 50 that deserve really close consideration and ultimately have to uh, winnow it down to six. And these six episodes are the best of the bunch. How, how did you come up with the number six? Um, usually, uh, you know, like when we think of like series, we think of a 10 and I know Netflix is like trying to do like episodes that at eight now, but uh, you guys came up with six, or this is the six best that you think definitely should be told. When Netflix told us six, I'm calling them right now to let them know that you said it should be eight. They're not taking my call. It's so, you know, that's, what can I tell you? I guess I'm not important enough, but yeah, they told us six um, and, you know, it's the first season. So obviously there's a proof of concept element out there. I do think based on the reaction to the trailer and enthusiasm, I'm, watching just people pile on in social media, being excited about it, particularly on Instagram. Um, I think we'll do just fine. And maybe next season we'll do a few more. <laughs> now, when, when you actually started this docuseries, I, 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 I've watched a few episodes and I noticed the timing of it. Uh, a lot of it was filmed during the pandemic. What, was, was that proved to be a challenge uh, to, to do something like this? Yeah, it really was. I actually became a COVID compliance officer myself because I just wanted to make sure that everything that we did was by the book and we can keep our, our crew and our subjects safe. But we have the, the best crew in the business and they were extraordinary in terms of making sure they got everything they needed in term, uh, as it relates to the production, not cutting any corners because of COVID because we always need that level of investment for, where you feel like you're inside the story while at the same time taking every precaution and following every protocol. So yes, certainly it felt like twice as hard as it normally is. And it's, it's usually pretty hard to begin with, but we got through. Now, I also found uh, your series uh, a bit, a little bit ambitious in the fact that uh, you didn't seek uh, stories here in the United States. You seek the stories worldwide that actually led to travels to uh, Greece and uh, Japan. Could you talk about, uh, you know, basically going all around the world to seek your stories and and the difficulties of, uh, you know, filming those stories. Sure. Well, you know, the the bond that we have for cats and the love we have for cats, we wanted to show that it wasn't just an, an American thing. 
Um, so a lot of times we as Americans, myself included, we tend to feel like the universe revolves around us. Of course it doesn't. So we really did want it to feel global. And it was important that we have at least a couple episodes and that were international. So 40% of the episodes are international in Japan. And I um, mean, my math's not good. That's 33% actually of the episodes. That's why I'm a film producer and not a doctor or mathematician. But um, we have those two episodes in, in uh, Greece and in Japan. You know, and the language barrier is always the, the most difficult thing because the way that uh, it works is we shoot our, these episodes and we do the interviews. And then we bring it back here to edit it, but we can't understand a single word anyone's saying, right? So we have to send those interviews out for transcription. And then we have to reference those, those transcriptions while we're editing and subtitle it, do all those things. It's quite difficult. And obviously there's local customs and there's local protocols that are different than, than uh, the protocols and customs that we have here. So yeah, it certainly is a, a level of difficulty that isn't associated with what we do domestically. And that's why it's 33% of the shows and, and not 77% um, of the shows. I think my math was right there. <laughs> did, did you personally emphasize with uh, any of these one stories in particular that hit, hit you the most? You know, I think um, the, the Grease episode entitled God's Little People really resonated with me. Um, before um, I was a producer, uh, I did a lot of work in animal rescue. Um, I dedicated years of my life to it. And the job of, of operating a sanctuary or being involved in, in rescue in any capacity, it's, it requires every last fiber of your being. And there's no day off you rescue one dog, one cat, there's always another dog or cat behind it. Or if there's a dog or a cat in peril of being euthanized, you know, if you go out to dinner that night and take the night off, that might be the night that the dog doesn't make it, right? Where you could have been working to, or the cat doesn't make it. And that could have been the night that you were working to find that cat or dog a home. So there's a, there's a term that's associated with animal rescue that, that sounds self-serving, but it really isn't. It's called compassion exhaustion where you just have your heart open to these animals every minute of every day and it starts to wear on you. And to be able to tell the story of two really remarkable people who have made a cat rescue their life's work and have, have given every last penny they have to the cause was really uh, resonant with me. And I, I, I felt honored to be able to help tell that story. Do you find that there is some kind of commonality with all your subjects, the fact that they're not uh exhausted at this point uh trying to help out these uh, these cats well yeah i mean the people who do um this kind of work they're they're typically strong people because you have to be and they're highly motivated people they're energetic people the people have a lot of stam stamina um so to that extent yeah i mean that's a common thread that runs through all the people that do that kind of work and it's always impressive to me and personally for you, Glenn, are you a cat or a dog person since you've now you have done both docuseries? Sorry, you're, you're breaking up. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> Put me on the spot. I honestly, it's, it's going to sound like a cop-out answer, but I'm both. Uh, the cats were my, my gateway animal. I started with cats. Uh, at one time, I was a single guy living in a one-bedroom apartment with three cats. That says it all. And, um, and then I think, you know, dogs require a bit more responsibility. Cats could take care of themselves pretty well. Uh, it's got to change the litter and make sure there's food and water and give them a bit of love. Dogs require more than that. So as I matured and became more responsible, and as I had a bit more means in my life, to because it does require more means to have a dog, there's just more costs associated with having a dog, whether it's a dog walker, having to put the dog in the kennel, and so on and so forth. Then I started to evolve towards dogs. And I had one dog uh, for 17 years and passed away right before the pandemic. We're still broken hearted but at the moment that means I have no animals and I'm just getting to the point where I'm almost ready to open my heart to another one not sure if it's gonna be a dog or a cat or both just yet or a ferret <laughs> well that's a, that, that would be an excellent journey for you I mean I, I, I went the opposite direction I actually started off with multiple dogs and now now I have no dogs and I have a uh, and then uh, someone um rescued two cats and thought it was a great idea by uh by dropping off the cats into my house and yeah. I was not a cat person. Uh -huh. So, uh, so I thought I could free the cats just by opening a window and right. let, let, let them loose. And, and every night they, they just come back. So <laughs> they got you trained. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, uh, so, so for you, Glenn, I mean, um, 
you know, you, you got dogs off to the side, you got um, cat cat people, um, you know, um, re ready to pre premiere. Is what 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 is the next direction um, for um, for yourself? Are are we looking at uh, back to dogs and cats again, or you're just going to look at uh, other animals and maybe maybe do something unique like ferrets, like you mentioned? <laughs> right. I, I actually really do love ferrets. I don't know if I could do a series about them, but I think I call them cat snakes. But um, I don't know they could support a Netflix series. Uh, we have a new series coming out in August on Showtime called UFO, which obviously is about UFOs that we produced with J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot that we're terribly excited about. Uh, just before I started this interview, I was watching a cut of uh, our documentary, Four Seasons Total Documentary, which is about Four Seasons Total Landscaping. And we do have another animal show in production called The Bond that we're producing with Susan Downey and Robert Downey Jr., which is about our bonds with really um, do uh, animals that were never intended to be domesticated. So not dogs and cats, much more unique animals, but these are not people who keep exotic pets. These are animals and, and human beings who intersected because it was necessary for the animals to survive. Absolutely. And before I let you glow, go, um, Glenn, um, when viewers finally watch this on Netflix, and um, is, is there like an important lesson that you hope that they could walk away with after watching um, all these episodes? You know, I, yeah, I think there, there are a couple things. Um, first and foremost, you know, dogs and cats, they've always been here for us with their unconditional love. They give us everything we need. They've always done right by us, but we don't always do right by dogs and cats. Um, we're doing a pretty bad job, actually. There's those of us who, who really love dogs and spoil them and love cats and spoil them, but there's far too many dogs and cats who still need homes and who aren't treated properly and, and, are, and need our help. And I think if we can celebrate these animals, maybe it will inspire just a few more people to do the right thing and treat these animals better. I think the other thing, the other lesson is, obviously we're at a point in time in our society where we're quite divided um, to, to the extreme. But anytime we can find something that we all agree on, that we all love, that shows us that we have a lot that unites us and that we have a lot in common, that's always a really good thing. And I think both dogs and cats are something that remind us of that. They're animals that we all love, that we all treat like family, those of us who do have them as part of our lives. And maybe that will push us in the right direction to get us to be a little bit closer together yet again sometime soon. Well, well said. Well, Glenn, hey, it's been a pleasure uh, carrying this conversation with you. And I look forward to your, talking to you next time for your next project. That would be awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, not a problem. Next time. Bye now.